So it's an immense pleasure to introduce uh, Michnia Propa from Harvard, who is going to tell us about uh, a minimal exponents of uh, singularities. Michnia? All right. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation and for the introduction. It's, um, it's my pleasure to speak at this nice event. Um, I uh, want to start gently by um, showing you some identities, some differential identities that are satisfied by some simple functions. Okay, so let's, let's uh, start. So these are identities that are satisfied by almost all uh, integers m. The first one I hope is completely uncontroversial. If I take the um, identity function f of x equals x, then um, if we take um, the derivative of f to the m plus one, then um, we get uh, the expression m plus one times um, f to the power m, okay? Um, here's a slightly more interesting example. Um, I can look at the quadric cone, so at uh, the sum of squares in n variables. And I can consider another simple expression in um, partial derivatives, namely the Laplace operator, the sum of the squares of the partials. And um, if I, um, it's, it's not too complicated to compute this. Uh, if you apply this differential operator to f to the m plus one, you obtain the expression in m, um, m plus one times four m plus two n times uh, again, f to the power m. Okay, um, something that's uh, slightly harder to guess, um, it still can be done. It's a very simple function, the simple cusp in the plane, f of x, y equals x squared plus y cubed. Um, it's a little harder to come up with a differential operator, but it's possible. You can consider, for instance, this expression here in you know, partials of x and y uh, with some um, functional coefficients, if you apply this differential operator to f to the power m plus one, again, you obtain some polynomial relation in m, this, this thing here, m plus one times m plus five over six plus times m plus seven over six, again, times f to the n, okay? So it's kind of a general pattern here. And what's the motivation for looking for expressions of this sort? Well, I, one of the original motivations was to answer the following question. Okay, if um, let's think of m as being, say, a positive integer here, when does the fraction one over f to the m generate the localization of the polynomial ring in n variables over c, the localization at f? When does it generate it over um, the sheaf or the ring of differential operators? I mean, here x is just c to the n but I'm introducing this notation dx because we might talk about other varieties later on. Um, so when is it possible to generate the localization uh, with the fraction one over f to the m? And there was very good motivation for asking this question in turn. And this motivation was, um, this was related to the um, problem of the analytic continuation of the Archimedean zeta function. This is a problem from the 60s. Um, I won't get into it right now, but I will say a few things about zeta functions, hopefully at the end of the lecture. Um, this, you know, that problem was solved originally by um, um, Gelfand and Natia by looking at resolution of singularities, but Bernstein also gave a solution involving the tools that I'm gonna discuss next. Okay, so um, these questions are kind of fully answers, answered by the main result in this area which is the well-known existence of the Bernstein-Sato polynomial. Okay, so this is uh, a theorem of Bernstein and Sato, which says the following. Um, for every polynomial, or we have versions over for regular functions on an algebraic variety, or even slightly more subtle for germs of analytic functions. Anyways, for every polynomial f, um, there exists um, a unique monic polynomial of um, minimal degree, um, bf of s, which is a polynomial um, in the variable s with complex coefficients, and another polynomial in s, but this time whose coefficients are differential operators on x, 
such that the um, formal relation P applied to F to the uh, power S plus one equals BF of S times F to the S holds, okay? So you, you saw on the previous slides, you know, when we specialize S to integers, I showed you some relations of this form. This is what I was doing on the first page. Um, and when you do give various numerical values to S, you can make sense of this as an identity of functions. But in general, it's a formal identity and it makes perfect sense um, in a D module on X, all right? So I'm just saying this to, to tell you that there is a way in which you can make very good sense of this expression. So more precisely, you look at functions on X, you localize them at F, you take the polynomial ring over that in, the, in one variable, and then you take the rank one module over that polynomial ring generated by the formal symbol F to the S, um, where you can define differentiation according to the usual rules of um, differentiation. And you know, this, in this form, uh, this identity makes perfect sense in this D module, okay? Like I said, when we specialize to various values, we get um, all kinds of information. And let me show you a couple of things that we can say um, immediately. Okay, so let me repeat the, um, the um, Bernstein Sato identity here. Um, one immediate comment is that S plus one, as soon as F is a non-trivial polynomial, S plus one divides the Bernstein Sato polynomial. Okay, this is quite easy to see by uh, simply plugging in S equals negative one in the expression. And then uh, because F is non-trivial, it's kind of immediate to see that you have to have a BF vanish at negative one. Okay, so let's um, retain this for uh, later on. But another thing that we can do is to um, look at the positive integer and then take S to be equal to negative M minus one. Okay. And if you do this, you see that BF of negative M minus one times the ratio one over F to the M plus one uh, does belong to the um, submodule generated over differential operators by one over F to the M, okay? So this gives us at least a theoretical answer to the motivational question that I um, raised a little earlier, right? You, you see as soon as um, this uh, quantity here is non-trivial on the left, non-zero, then we get a nice thing, right? That one over F to the M um, generates the localization at F over differential operators. If the bernstein sato polynomial has no integer roots, there are strictly less than negative M, right? Because we can then kind of recursively do this, you know, and we always have something non-trivial on the left, okay? So this is one of the many, many reasons why it's um, very interesting to be able to say something about the roots of the bernstein sato polynomial. I mean, for those who think about this, um, I mean, this, the, you know, the people are aware that these roots are very important, that they're by now well-known invariants of the singularities of F, and it's important to study them. And um, there are some deep results that have been known already for a while about these roots, and I want to list a few of them now. And the first and most important, it's Kashivara's theorem from the 70s that the roots of the bernstein sato polynomial are all uh, negative rational numbers. Okay, so um, this is done by Kashivara by using resolution of singularities. Okay, and we'll see an improvement of this result in a little while. Okay, now what rational numbers are these guys? Especially if we think of them in terms of resolution of singularities, can we say something more precise? And um, yes, we can, at least about the, um, the greatest root of the bernstein sato polynomial. Okay, so I remind you that this is a, um, um, you know, this is a negative rational number. We define alpha F to be its negative. So now we're looking at a positive rational number. And the statement is that this root or the negative of this root is equal to what's called the log canonical threshold of F. Okay, so this is another very famous invariant of singularities, ubiquitous invariant of singularities in birational geometry, in complex geometry. It kind of appears everywhere. So I 
I listed here a few places where it plays a crucial role. For instance, in rationality questions, if you look at birational rigidity, or as a threshold for when vanishing theorems apply, as a threshold for the integrability of functions, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are, you know, I'm sure everyone has at least heard of this invariant, um, very important invariant of singularities. Well, it is one of the roots of the bernstein sutter polynomial, at least up to sign. But for what I want to describe uh, later, I actually want to look at it more concretely. I want to tell you precisely how to think of this, uh, of the local threshold in birational geometry, okay? So let's be very concrete here. Um, what we do is to take a log resolution of the pair xd, where d is the um, zero locus of our function f that we're studying, okay? So let me assume for simplicity that um, D is reduced. It's a reduced hypersurface. Just, you know, it makes, it makes um, just the exposition a little simpler. So what does this mean? We're looking at the proper birational map um, such that the pullback of the divisor D um, has simple normal crossing support. Okay, that's the definition of a log resolution. But based on this construction, we can introduce a few numerical invariants. Um, you can look, for instance, at the pullback of the divisor D, and uh, that consists of the proper transform D tilde here with coefficient one, because I assume D to be reduced. And uh, then there are exceptional divisors, components of the exceptional locus, and each of them appears with a non-negative coefficient there, an integer. So we get these integers AI. It's also natural to look at um, uh, what's called the relative canonical divisor of the resolution. Okay, so this is an actual divisor on Y, which, you know, locally is given as the divisor of the determinant of the Jacobian of the map. So kind of like in calculus, you have the Jacobian matrix, you take its determinant. Um, in any case, this is a divisor that's supported again on the exceptional locus, and we get some coefficients BI for each exceptional divisor. If you're a little bit careful with how you choose your resolution, it's not too hard to arrange that all these coefficients appear with positive, uh, you know, do appear. You know, all the exceptional divisors do appear in these two expressions. So in other words, the numbers AI and BI are strictly positive. Okay. So once we have this numerical information coming from a resolution, we can define the following quantity gamma to be the minimum over all the ratios bi plus one over ai coming from the resolution, right, that I just introduced. And it turns out that the law canonical threshold, one of the equivalent interpretations in birational geometry is that it's the minimum between one and this quantity gamma, okay, this rational number gamma. Okay, and this in fact, it's independent of the choice of log resolution. And as I said earlier, is equal to the negative of the largest root of the bernstein sato polynomial. So that root acquires a simple interpretation in terms of any resolution of singularities, okay? This kind of a very nice way to think of this root of the bernstein sato polynomial. Let me give you some examples. In fact, let's go back to uh, the polynomials that we had at the very beginning of the lecture. Um, so first, you can look at the quadric cone. And um, here you can compute easily using resolution of singularities. In fact, you only have to blow up the vertex of the cone in ambient space. You can show that this log canonical threshold is equal to one. So the terminology in birational geometry is that this is a log canonical pair when the log canonical threshold is equal to one. But if you want to take the bernstein sato path, you recall what I showed you at the very beginning, if you look here, this is the bernstein sato polynomial, the quadric cone, and evidently negative one is its greatest root, right? The other root is negative n over two, okay? Or we can look at um, the other example I gave you, the cusp in the plane. And again, this is kind of the first famous computation in birational geometry. You can do something explicitly with resolutions, you know, is the picture where you take three consecutive blow-ups at points and 
uh, you obtain something with simple normal crossings, you can do the calculation and the log canonical threshold comes out to be five over six. It's strictly less than one. So this is when we say that the pair is not log canonical. Um, again, it matches what we saw at the very beginning. Uh, if you look here, it's not too hard to show that this is the Bernstein Sato polynomial of F. And again, by inspecting it, you see that the greatest root is negative five over six. Okay. So this is kind of what I was uh, trying to show at the very beginning. Okay, hold on. Now I don't know how to get rid of this. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry. Just a moment. Go back here. All right, so these are some examples of log canonical thresholds. And um, again, what was nice is that we have this interpretation in terms of log resolutions. And the main question is, can we say analogous thing about things about the other roots of the bernstein sato polynomial or some of the other roots? Can we compute in an analogous fashion in terms of resolution of singularities? How much can we say in terms of resolution of singularities? Okay. Um, and this leads me to another well-known result about the bernstein sato polynomial, this time from the 80s, so still from quite a while ago. It's a result of Lichtin, which improves Kashivara's theorem on the rationality of the roots. Um, namely, all of them are of the form negative bi plus l over ai, where bi and ai are the coefficients that I show you, the discrepancies on the resolution of singularities, and L is um, a positive integer. They all have to look like that, but there is a tricky thing here. Um, the exceptional divisor in a resolution go from you know, F1 to Fm. So they, they run from one to M. Here I'm saying I greater than or equal to zero. So let's pay attention to this. I'm, I'm including I equals zero, which is a convention. You know, I'm taking B zero to be zero and A zero to be one. This has a perfectly good meaning I'm not only running over the exceptional divisors in the resolution, I'm also including the proper transform of the divisor in the calculation. This seems like a minor modification, but in fact, it is exactly what causes a lot of headache in this problem, as we'll see as we move on, okay? So in particular, I'm allowing all negative integers in this list. And the point is that this theorem gives us no control whatsoever on the integer L that appears. So in some sense, it looks nice, but it's still quite far from providing a precise answer of how to write the roots of the bernstein sato polynomial in terms of resolution of singularities. OK? No, can I have a question? Please. Uh, but, but at least it bounds the denominator or something? Or... The, uh, the denominator of um, here. The... I mean, like the roots uh, would be. Um, I mean, for instance, you can have any negative integer whatsoever as a root of this polynomial. And those are the ones that uh, cause headaches. All the others are bounded in terms of resolutions, indeed. Yeah. Hmm. OK. OK. Um, yeah, so you, you'll, you'll, if you look carefully what I'm going to say next, you'll see that this is exactly the problem. You know, this this L. Excuse me? Yes. But is it the same L for all I's or? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, you're yeah. right. I should put LI there. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a different L uh, for each I. OK. All right. So I'm going to focus on only one root. I can say things about one root of the bernstein sato polynomial, which I'm, you know, kind of polemically going to call the main root here. You know, I'll, I'll <laughs> you know, there's no technical definition for that, <laughs> but uh, but I hope to convince you that uh, it it dictates a lot of the behavior of everything in some sense, and it is more refined than the log canonical threshold. So it's very easy to define. Right. I told you at the beginning that if f is non-trivial, s plus 1 always divides the bernstein sato polynomial. So I just want to get rid of it. Okay, We get rid of the root negative 1 with multiplicity 1. That's called the reduced bernstein sato polynomial. And then by analogy, 
we define the minimal exponent to be the negative of the greatest root of this new polynomial. Okay, and this is a terminology introduced by Saito. In other papers, Saito also calls it the micro local volcanic threshold. And there are other papers in which it doesn't appear in this context, it appears as the Arnold's uh, profit or exponent or as the complex singularity index and so on and so forth. So there's very good reason for each one of these names. I'm not gonna get into any of them. They really belong to different areas somehow. So let's call it the minimal exponent. It is what it is. And so since I've gotten rid of the root negative one, it is clear from the definition that the minimum between one and the minimal exponent is the log canonical threshold, is the other root alpha f. So you see it's a finer invariant. It determines the log canonical threshold, but it's not, only, it's not always different from it. So let's kind of focus a bit more on uh, where we find interesting information here. If you're in the, if you're not in the log canonical case, so this is the worst singularities. Um, uh, the log canonical threshold is less than one. So you see by definition, it's equal to the minimal exponent. And so for us, this case is not interesting, which is to say, you know, I'm not saying that it's not interesting to study log canonical thresholds, but they're very well understood. And, you know, that's an area of its own. We don't get anything new besides that study here. Okay. So the interesting case for us is the log canonical case where alpha f is equal to one. And most of the time, this minimal exponent is the, a genuinely new invariant. I'm saying most of the time, not always, because nobody says that you couldn't have negative one as a root with higher multiplicity. So it's still possible to have them both be equal to one. However, most of the time is not the case and we know exactly when. This is a nice theorem of Saito from the 90s which says that the minimal exponent is strictly bigger than one if, and only if the zero locus of our function has rational singularity. Okay, so this is kind of, in some sense, the nicest class of singularities beyond smooth points in birational or complex geometry, and it's precisely characterized by this inequality. Okay, so one way, one thing to keep in mind for the rest of the talk, or how to think about the minimal exponent when it's large is that it's kind of a, a bit of a refinement, a numerical refinement of the notion of rational singularities. Okay, it's gonna come up later. All right, so now let's see some examples of this minimal exponent. I showed you examples of log canonical thresholds. Let's see examples of minimal exponents. There are two main classes of singularities where we know how to, we, we know exactly what they are. For instance, we can look at diagonal hypersurfaces x1 to the a1 plus xn to the an. Let's say all the ai are at least two to have an actual singularity. And then the minimal exponent is equal to the sum of the ratios one over ai. This is a special case of a result about, a general result about weighted homogeneous polynomials with isolated singularities. Um, each variable has a weight between zero and one and the minimal exponent is the um, the sum of these weights. This is a result of site. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Let's note that um, you can achieve the largest value, so kind of the nicest singularity, <clears throat> as it's clear, when all the AI are equal to two. Okay, then it becomes, so for the quadric cone, this minimal exponent is n over two. But it turns out that this is actually the best bound for any singularity. This is another theorem of Saito, which who showed that for arbitrary f, we have that the minimal exponent is bounded by n over two. So in fact, one can do better, and I'll show an, an improvement later um, where multiplicities are involved. I mean, this two should be, really be thought of as the multiplicity of the quadric cone. Okay, uh, another class of examples where we know what the answer is, is that of ordinary singularities. So the simplest case would be the cone over a smooth hypersurface of degree m in pn minus one. Okay, then the minimal exponent 
uh, is equal to the dimension of the ambient space divided by the multiplicity of the point, right? As I said here, you really see the multiplicity come into play. Okay, and you know, something like a Fermat hypersurface belongs to both worlds. Okay. So we, we have a good understanding in some cases, and these come from mostly from D module theory. Our question was, is there a relationship with resolution of singularities? Can I think of this minimal exponent somehow in terms of these discrepancies on the resolution? And there's a starting point to make a guess. Right, so by definition, we had that the minimum between one and the minimal exponent is the log canonical threshold. But I also told you that in birational geometry, one of the equivalent characterizations of the log canonical threshold is that it's the minimum between one and gamma, where gamma is this um, minimum over all these ratios defined by discrepancies. So, I mean, if you look at this, there's kind of an obvious guess that you can make if there's going to be a nice answer. Um, you know, it, it, the answer kind of should be that alpha f tilde is equal to gamma, right? And Lichten did ask this question, very natural question, can we refine this to alpha f tilde equals gamma? That would give us a complete answer. It would be exactly what we want, okay? And as you can guess from the way I'm presenting this, this is not true. Um, and um, this was noted by Collar. Uh, Collar uh, mentions in his Singularities of Pairs notes uh, that the answer is no. And it's not surprising that this was noted by a birational geometer. Um, it's not about an example. It's kind of about, about a phenomenon that, you know, if you work a lot with resolution of singularities, you notice. Namely, this invariant gamma doesn't, does depend usually on the choice of resolution. It's really interesting, right? So the minimum between one and gamma does not depend on the choice of resolution. That's the log canonical threshold. But if you look at gamma itself, it's not hard to see that it depends. More precisely, if you find the resolution with gamma is strictly bigger than one, then you can blow up carefully chosen centers of that resolution, and you can actually make gamma be smaller and smaller and smaller, kind of approaching one somehow. And of course, alpha f tilde doesn't depend on anything, so that, that's just an invariant of f. Okay? So this doesn't happen in general. Okay? And it, and it turns out, and this is what I want to describe next, the, to, to study alpha f tilde is, in fact, much more complicated than studying the log canonical threshold. And so with Mustatsa, we've done some work on studying this. And the tool that we use is the relationship of alpha f tilde with the theory of mixed Hodge modules of Saito, right? With somehow with Hodge theory and with D module theory without forgetting about birational geometry. Okay. So I want to explain a little bit of this study next. I mean, but. But, but you can ask for a special resolution or something. Or... Say again? Yeah, I, I, yeah I'll, I'll actually, you can ask something okay. and I'm going to ask it at the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and when you have special resolutions, it's true that you look for them there. So for instance, uh, if you think about, um, you know, like the, the first example that I gave earlier was kind of a toric case. And then you can look at toric divisors and so on and so forth. So. You, you can ask more specialized questions, but in general, you'll see it's very hard to make a, a clean guess. I'll show you something at the end. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. All right, so what are the objects that we do sort of, let's say, Hodge theory with, okay? I remind you, we have a function f, and it, we look at it zero locus d, okay? And we're gonna consider these sheaves on x, the um, quasi-coherent sheaves, called denoted by OX star D. So this is the sheaf of functions on X with poles of arbitrary order along D, okay? So locally, you know, if let's say you look at an open set where this is spec R, right? And you have the function F, this is simply the localization of R at F. So it's quite clear that this is not just a quasi coherent sheaf, but it's actually a D module. It has an action of differentiation by the quotient rule, when you take a fraction with denominator f to some power, the answer stays of this form, okay? 
But the main point is that this is not just a D module, but it's a kind of a special D module that comes from Hodge theory in some sense. It's a D module that underlies what Saito calls a mixed Hodge module on X. Okay, so you know from the point of view of the theory of mixed Hodge modules, so internally to this theory, this is a very simple definition. All we're doing is we're looking at the complement of the hypersurface. Um, let's call it U, and then we're pushing forward from U to X what's called a trivial Hodge module. So this is kind of funky notation, but all it means is the trivial Hodge module so associated to the trivial variation of Hodge structure Q on U, okay? Of course, the theory of mixed Hodge module is very complicated. The definition of this push forward is complicated. There's a lot of technicalities behind, behind this definition that I cannot do in this talk, but rather I'll focus on what pro properties OX star D inherits from this theory. And the main thing I want to tell you that, that comes out from this theory is that there, um, this, this D module comes with the canonical Hodge filtration, comes with a good filtration in the sense of the theory of Hodge, uh, sorry, of D modules. Here it's indexed by the non-negative integers. So this is the Hodge filtration in Saito's theory. It's as soon as D is not smooth, this is a kind of complicated and mysterious filtration. We don't understand it very well. But we do understand one property that's uh, not so hard to prove and was proved by Saito again a long time ago, that this Hodge filtration is contained in a much simpler filtration. That's just the filtration by the order of the poles, right? What's called the pole order filtration, okay? Which is given by line bundles listed here, right? So functions with poles of order at most k plus one on x. So, um, this filtration is too naive to understand the singularities of D or the Hodge theory very well, but it allows us to, to define a nice technical tool, right? So because you have a coherent sheaf included in a line bundle, uh, this gives rise to an ideal for each K, an ideal sheaf. And these are now called the, the Hodge ideals of the divisor D. So um, it was actually Christian Schnell who pointed out to me first that this kind of construction, you know, the, you know, the, there's a nice sequence of ideals that kind of comes out of this, um, you know, these results that Saito has been proving about the Hodge filtration of uh, on, um, on on the localization here in particular. Okay, so what what I did with Mustaz of what we've been doing for some time is to kind of look at these ideals in a different way, to to provide another point of view coming more from birational geometry. So we define them in terms of resolution of singularities. You, maybe if you're familiar with the theory of multiplier ideals, it's something in that spirit, but where you look at more complicated complexes on a resolution, you take some push forwards, do various calculations. Anyway, there is a definition in terms of resolution of singularities that agrees with Saito's definition. I mean, a concrete definition in terms of resolutions. And it has great advantages. Um, namely, it allows you to compare things with these invariants of resolution of singularities that I told you about. One thing that we get from this approach is to show that if the invariant gamma that we saw earlier, right, that minimum over the ratios, bi plus one over ai, is greater than or equal to some integer k plus one, then the kth Hodge ideal is trivial. And so necessarily also the ones below it, right? So just as a small aside, if you look back at the definition, this is the same as saying that the Hodge filtration at that level is as simple as possible. Namely, it looks, it's equal to the pole order filtration. This is something that people in Hodge theory are um, inter interested in to see kind of how far you can go and have, you know, the simplest behavior for the, Hodge filtration. Okay, so let's remember this. There is some triviality criterion in terms of our invariant gamma, but there's something very similar that happens with the minimal exponent. And this comes from the theory of D modules. So Saito also started analyzing these Hodge ideals more precisely in terms of what's called the V filtration. Okay. Um, now, in general, in the theory of D modules, 
Um, one of the most important notion is the notion of a V filtration along a function F or a hypersurface. This was introduced by Kashivar and Malgrange in order to provide kind of a Riemann Hilbert analog of the notion of nearby and vanishing cycles for uh, constructible sheaves. And um, Saito enhanced this to something he calls the micro local V filtration, is kind of a technical extension without getting into details. Um, we look at its trace on the structure sheaf OX. So this is a filtration indexed by the rational numbers by ideal sheaves in OX, by subsheaves, coherent subsheaves of OX, so ideal sheaves. And they coincide with Hodge ideals up to something, modulo the equation F. But what's kind of you know, important in Saito's theory is that the minimal exponent appears crucially here, plays a crucial role. Namely, it's the index where the microlocal V filtration becomes trivial. And so if you use this work of Saito, you also have this relation that the minimal exponent is greater than or equal to an integer k plus one if and only if the k Hodge ideal is true. So let me remind you what I said on the previous slide. With the birational geometry approach, you see that if gamma is at least k plus one, that at least in one direction, you deduce that the Hodge ideals are trivial. Okay, so if you look at these two expressions, but you don't look too carefully, then you obtain this conclusion, which I stated here as a theorem, is a theorem I proved with Mustaza that uh, the minimal exponent is always greater than or equal to the gamma invariant on a resolution of singularity. Okay, so this is some positive answer to Lichtin's question. I remind you, um, we want to find a bio, some kind of log resolution interpretation for alpha f tilde, and Lichtin guessed that these two numbers are equal. And that Collard told us that that's not the case. But there is still an inequality that always holds in this direction. Okay. So I say, don't look too carefully. Of course, you cannot deduce this from the two expressions above because these are not integers. They're just rational numbers, right? So maybe you can deduce it up to round down, but that's not good enough, right? We want it on the nose. And to get it on the nose, we have to work a lot harder to obtain this result. But it comes kind of an, out of a general theory. So the, the point is that we've been talking about reduced hypersurfaces. But one can develop a theory of Hodge ideals also for Q divisors in general, just like with multiplier ideals. Or if you prefer, you know, rational powers um, of the function alpha, right? Alpha is a rational number. And the hardest part here is to prove a generalization of Saito's result relating Hodge ideals to the microlocal V filtration. Once we have that, we can put a similar machinery into practice. And even if we're interested in a reduced divisor, we consider these varying alphas and pass to a limit in alpha. And that gives us this sort of result on the nose. Okay. And I wanted to say here that there's also um, now very recently, there's a new proof of this result uh, due to Dirks and, Most Dirks and Mustaza of this inequality. So it's Still quite complicated, but if let's say you're a fan of D module theory, but you're not a big fan of Hodge theory, <laughs> um, I don't know, <laughs> there are some people like that. <laughs> so uh, then it kind of has the advantage that uh, it doesn't use the theory of mixed Hodge modules. Okay. However, you know, now I want to kind of insist on this approach because I think that the proof is better than the result in the sense that. Um, you know, what we did was to produce these more geometric objects, these Hodge ideals, and you analyze them in some way, and they told us something about alpha f tilde. And so the point is that you can say a lot more things about minimal exponents following this approach, right? You, you have a lot more flexibility. Like I said, now you have these geometric objects, and there are standard things that want you try to do with such things. For instance, you study the behavior of Hodge ideals with respect to restriction to hypersurfaces, or you study their semi-continuity behavior in families, you know, all sorts of things like that we're able to do. And in turn, they tell us properties of minimal exponents that are analogous to well-known facts about log canonical thresholds. 
So I give you a list here and the law canonical thresholds list, um, you know, it's kind of, you know, standard results that are not so hard to prove. This requires quite a bit more work here. So let me focus on a local version of the minimal exponent, right? So you, you can look at Bernstein subtle polynomials around the point X. You can define minimal exponents around the point X, right? There's a, there's a local version of these notions. Um, so if I look at a point whose multiplicity is M, then in fact, the minimal exponent is bounded by N over M. This is the improvement that I promised earlier. Right, Saito had a theorem saying that the minimal exponent is always bounded by n over two. But in fact, it's n over the multiplicity. That two, as I said, was the, just the two coming from the quadric cone. There's actually also a lower bound that one can show, but it requires more language and I'll, I'll skip. If you restrict to a hypersurface, of course, not contained in the zero locus of your function, then the minimal exponent uh, goes down. And you know this is kind of an inversion of a junction type statement, and it's not unexpected, right? It follows the exact same principle as always. Singularities can only get worse by restriction. Okay, um, I remind you that high minimal exponent is good. You know, all right. So um, minimal exponents are lower semi-continuous in families. This is a vague statement. It, it can mean various things. One example is that it's, it's lower semi-continuous as a function of the point x on x. Okay. And then I also listed, there's also Tom Sebastiani type inequality that one can obtain um, for, for sums of functions. Okay. So how does this number uh, relates to the Steenbrink spectrum? Yeah, exactly. So it's, um, it, this, is where, this is why it, is called the minimal exponent because for isolated singularities, it appears that the, uh, I don't, I get confused with the order, either the biggest or the lowest exponents in the, I the guess it's the lowest if it's minimal, right? <laughs> no, no, I think it's the biggest. Indeed. Maybe the biggest, I, I don't know, sorry. But anyway, yeah, exactly. So that's the point, that's how it appeared maybe originally for isolated singularities in the Stanbring spectrum. And exactly you know, what you're saying and various other works, if you take any of these properties, but with different interpretations of the minimal exponent, you can all extract them from the literature in the case of isolated singularities. Okay, Lozere, Stambring, Varchenko, perhaps others. Yeah, exactly, that, that's a very good point. Okay, it turns out that these properties are true in general, in full general. Okay, so I told you various things that we can say about the minimal exponent. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll come back to general, I mean, at the very end, I'll come back to, um, you know, understanding the minimal exponent or both, both pessimistic and optimistic notes. But I want to kind of take a break from telling you about it. And I want to tell you a bit how to use it like where it appears. Because I think this is a nice thing that's kind of emerging that we're beginning to see um, that it appears in a variety of contexts where somehow you don't see the law canonical threshold, right? The law canonical threshold doesn't make a big difference, but the minimal exponent seems to be a, the kind of provide the crucial balance. Okay, I'll, I'll give you two types of examples. One of them is related to D modules, right? So um, Here's um, the kind of the slogan is that it controls the complexity of the Hodge filtration, you know, given by the localization at F. I'll make the statement and then I'll explain. Okay, so the theorem we proved is that the Hodge filtration on OX star D is generated at level K naught, where K naught is the dimension N minus one minus the roundup of the minimal exponent. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, we're, we're talking about filtrations in the sense of D modules. And so these filtrations by definition have to be compatible with the standard filtration on differential operators. 
if you look at FL of dx, this denotes differential operators of order at most L, then this, you know, if you apply that to FK, you have to land in FK plus L. Okay, like, you know, if you're more geometrically oriented, I mean, this is the analog of Griffith's transversality for variations of Hodge structures. And so um, now it, it is a good filtration. And so it's known that this has to become an equality beyond a certain point. And this theorem tells you what that point is, or at least gives a bound for, you know, when things become, when things stabilize. The theorem tells you that for k, at least k naught, you have equality in this expression for all L. So in other words, there is nothing new in the Hodge filtration beyond level k naught. Right, you only obtain stuff by applying differential operators to lower pieces. Okay, so in this sense, it controls it controls the um, complexity of the Hodge filtration. Okay, and um, and I should say that um, this is an optimal bound, as shown by the case of isolated weighted homogeneous singularities when it was computed by Saito and by Zhang more recently um, that. This is precisely the generation level. You cannot do better. You cannot obtain equality at a lower level. Okay. All right. So I'm more of a geometer, and um, maybe the next uh, result is more kind of in my world, but it turns out that it's completely equivalent. Um, so um, what we showed is a local vanishing theorem, you know, or what the minimal exponent controls is a local vanishing theorem um, in kind of birational or complex geometry. But it turns out that this geometric statement or you know resolution of singularity statement is completely equivalent to the theorem here about the complexity of the Hodge filtration. So this is quite surprising. It takes a while to get used to, but it's exactly the same statement as, as the complexity one. Okay, anyway, let's, let's look at it. Um, so I have my hypersurface on X and we take a log resolution of singularities. I remind you that this means that the um, um, pullback of D has simple normal crossing support. Let's call it, let's call this support E. Then you look at higher direct images of all bund of bundles of holomorphic forms with log poles on Y. And the statement is that you have vanishing for RQ mu lower star of omega n minus Q when Q is bigger than the same number we saw before, that you know, generation level for the Hodge filtration n minus one minus uh, the roundup of alpha F tilde. Okay, so let me try to put this in context. Um, it is the case that if you look at RP mu lower star omega Q, this is always zero for P plus Q strictly bigger than N. This is the local version of the famous Nakano vanishing theorem. And this local version was proved by Saito using mixed Hodge modules again. And then Mustatsa and I found a proof at some point that goes along more elementary lines and more in line with proofs of vanishing theorems. Um, but even for Q equals N, when you look at the canonical bundle, this is kind of a famous result. It's called a um, local vanishing for multiplier ideals. And it's proved using Kodaira vanishing or perhaps uh, kavamata Vivek vanishing. Okay, very useful to, um, in the theory of multiplier ideals. Okay, but what the theorem says is that you have more vanishing you have vanishing, even, even kind of borderline vanishing when the sum of the exponents equals n, you have very useful extra vanishing and the bigger the minimal exponent is, the more vanishing you have, okay? Um, and I should remind you something that we looked at earlier. So um, the minimal exponent is strictly bigger than one if and only if the divisor D has rational singularities. And so we, we had made a conjecture about this case, right? When D has rational singularities, Mustazzo Alano and I conjectured a few years ago that you should have this vanishing for Q bigger than N minus three. This was proved. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. I, was wondering, I was wondering if this was now one maybe a 
isolated singularities or something like this. I, I don't I don't know. In fact, we proved we proved it in our paper for isolated singularities. Yeah, in the paper where we made the conjecture, um, we proved this for isolated singularities for the first time. So using using kind of let's say more elementary some Hodge theory, so some mixed mixed Hodge theory. Um, but the full result was proved more recently by Quebecus and Schnell, um, yet again using Hodge modules in a completely different context and addressing very different problems. Um, they get, there's a beautiful paper that they wrote and they proved this conjecture. Um, but I wanna point out that this kind of always thinks of just alpha f strictly bigger than one. We've seen that in fact, alpha f can be bigger and bigger and bigger up to n over two. And the bigger it gets, the more vanishing you have. Okay. All right. So, anyways, you know, I wanted to make this aside to kind of show you um, how you can use um, these uh, minimal exponents or where they appear. Um, but I want to um, sort of conclude the talk by um, going back to, you know, our attempt to understand them. And I've told you many things about them. I mean, we really understand them quite well by now, but uh, I don't know if you've forgotten the original question. The thing is, we still haven't solved our main problem. <laughs> okay, at least the way I started this talk, what we want is a more precise description of the minimal exponent on each resolution of singularities, or at least to know that it does appear as something on each resolution of singularity. Okay, and we're still quite far from achieving this goal, but at least I can propose an answer. Okay, so we have a conjecture. Um, and this conjecture should be thought of as a strengthening of the inequality that I showed you, that alpha f tilde is at least the invariant gamma on a resolution. So maybe I should have written it again on this slide. I remind you that gamma was the minimum over all the ratios bi plus one over ai, where bi come from the relative canonical divisor and ai come from the pullback of the function f. Okay, and the conjecture is that in fact for every log resolution, there exists at least one distinguished exceptional divisor for which the associated ratio computes the minimal exponent. Okay, so you see, this is the minimum over all the ratios, but I want to say that alpha f tilde is one of the ratios on each resolution of singularity. Okay, this would be a much stronger statement. And um, as I said, we don't know how to prove this um, right now, and it could sound like it's perhaps a far-fetched conjecture, but I want to end by showing you that it's very much compatible with a famous conjecture in a kind of a different context. Okay, this is called the Guza strong monodromy conjecture. Okay, so this is kind of for amusement to end the talk, right? Like how, what happens here if we look at polynomials with integral coefficients, right? So f and z of x1, x n. Okay, so if you start with a polynomial like that, then you can count, you can count its solutions you know, for every prime p, you can count its solutions mod p to the m. Okay, let's denote by n m the number of solutions of this polynomial mod p to the m. Right, so there's this arithmetic count, and then you can introduce a kind of a generating series for all these counts, this q of f t, and where the coefficients are precisely these numbers of solutions mod p to the m. Okay. So Iguza has a famous result in this direction. Uh, he showed that if you take this generating series and do some change of variables and modify the expression a little bit, sorry, I'm trying to show this uh, stuff on the right. All right, so you modify, modify Q a little bit, then it turns out that this generating series is equal to what's called the local zeta function, the piadic integral of the absolute value of f to the s over zp, okay? So when you integrate in the um, 
Archimedean case, and you integrate over Rn or Cn and so on, these are exactly those Archimedean zeta functions that I told you about at the very beginning of the lectures, lecture that kind of led to the introduction of the bernstein sato polynomial. Here you have the Igusa zeta function being equal to this generating series up to some change of variables. And Igusa also showed using resolution of singularities that this is a rational function in p to the negative s whose poles are all among the ratios that we've been looking at all along. Okay, so the poles of these good as data functions are the negatives, um, are among the negatives of some of the ratios bi plus one over ai. Okay, so the strong monodromic conjecture says that um, the roots of the reduced Bernstein Sato polynomial, oh, sorry, let, let's forget about the these terms in the parentheses. I mean, like, let's, let's not make things even more technical. Let's say the roots of the Bernstein Sato polynomial of F um, contain all the poles of, the, uh, of this local zeta function. So the poles of the local zeta function are among the roots of the Bernstein Sato polynomial, okay? So there must be some distinguished roots of the Bernstein Sato polynomial that take exactly the shape of these ratios that appear in on resolution of singularities. And um, perhaps this wasn't phrased when this was originally conjecture, but it's a very natural addition to the conjecture. And it's exactly what happens in the Archimedean case, that the greatest such pole should be the negative of the minimal exponent, okay? This is exactly what Lozère proved in the Archimedean case, at least for isolated singularities, right? It's for integrals over Rn or Cn, I should say, it is known that this is the case, okay? And, you know, up to some technicalities that I'm kind of sweeping under the rug here, um, you know, the true picture, at least for polynomials with uh, integral coefficients should be that the minimal exponent if the greatest pole or its negative is the greatest pole of the Igusa zeta function, and then it's known that that's a quantity of the form bi plus one over ai. Okay, so there's a lot to be done here, but I think it's quite amusing that there is such um, kind of um, an interpretation of this. And um, well, final line that I want to say is that you know there are many other open problems still things that we know, important things that we know about log canonical thresholds that could and should be addressed for minimal exponents. Is there an ACC, uh, is there ACC behavior for minimal exponents, like for log canonical thresholds? Is there an analytic interpretation? Is there a characteristic P analog? And so on. So I think all of these are uh, very interesting questions, but um, I will stop here and I thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, hi, Mehmet. Hi. How are you? Um, good. So um, I had a question in my mind that was slightly different from the conjecture you ended up stating at the end. And I wonder if it's just obvious that this question, the answer is no. So that's, um, can is it possibly um, does there possibly exist a resolution, like some kind of minimal resolution, such that the uh, micro local log canonical threshold would be the minimum of those bi plus one right. over ai? Um, yeah, I understand this. So, this, you know, I, I can't, you know, swear that the answer is no, <laughs> but I, I'd be very inclined to say that the answer is no. I mean, it, it seems too ideal somehow. Yeah, and it's tough, but it's tough to find a cow, real counter example. Right? I, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't know, maybe I just don't know. I don't know, maybe if you talk to Kolar, he'll give you some some reason for this, but um, it's it's too nice. I mean, of course, you know, for because we don't really, let's say we're not interested in minimal exponents. Mm -hmm. We're just interested in resolution of singularities, right? Like uh, people would be looking for such a thing. Like, is there a, is there some kind of distinguished resolution, you know, some nice resolution? And in general, no, I mean, it's true for surfaces. It's perhaps, I guess it's true for toric varieties, but um, 
right? There are toric resolutions that you obtain by looking at the toric divisors. It's true for surfaces, but I'd be very surprised if this were the case in general. Yeah, this would be ideal. I agree. Yeah. Well, what about for isolated hypersurface singularities or something like that? I, I don't know. I I don't know. I'm. I'd be tempted to. I'd be kind of pessimistic, even in the isolated case. But yeah, who That's knows? I, may, I might be wrong. I mean, I I don't want to simply say no. But my feeling is that, um, yeah, I agree that this would be nice. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I will tell you what I think is that um, this is computed by the law canonical threshold of an ideal. So we just don't know how to find that ideal. So log canonical thresholds of things that are of higher co-dimension behave in a kind of a different way from log canonical thresholds of hypersurfaces. And so I think the game is that there is some kind of ideal that we have to find, ideal sheaf, whose log canonical threshold will be the minimal exponent. And so that will realize it clearly on a resolution. And it will probably, you know, we'll make it one of these coefficients. But, you know, I don't know what, uh, you know, I wish I knew <laughs> what that ideal was. That's uh, Thanks. Yeah. Very Other questions? Uh, can I actually I have two questions, a stupid one and maybe a reasonable one. So a stupid one is the following. You have mentioned Saito many times, but it's the same Saito. Who is actually always Marihiko, not Kyoja. Always Morihiko, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, you okay. know, I, I know I should say it because uh, it's always no, no. It's just that I mean, I suspect that Kyoji might be behind some of it, of course. No, no, no. It's always Morihiko Saito. Okay. It's always Morihiko Saito. And kind of a general question is: uh, Is there any, any kind of motivic integration interpretation of, of these things? No, no, no. Um, I think this would almost be as good as. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I assume you're asking and um you know because this is true about the law canonical threshold right i mean there's all work of mustard so exactly. yeah. yeah so we don't know i mean i think that that would be almost as good as proving what we want to okay to prove yeah um right so this is you know i kind of hinted at this on one slide one of the interpretation of the law canonical threshold is that it can be computed from the dimensions of uh, jet spaces all right yeah, I don't remember the formula exactly, but it can be computed in terms of the dimension of jet spaces. Mm -hmm. And we don't know anything um, like this for, um, for um, in this case. I, 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 I suspect that if we were able to say something would go through um, um, kind of saying something about zeta functions first, kind of like this, this right. um, uh, I mean, this slide you have on right now actually suggests also some kind of thing yeah. like that, right? Right, right, exactly. Okay. Right, so that, that's that's my guess. And the only way is to do some work with D modules and stuff to, to say things about, you know, the big motivic zeta function something and then specialize. <laughs> right. I, I don't know, I don't know. So no, not at the moment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I had a question. Um, so some of the computations you had up for you know, this minimal exponent of hypersurface singularities yes. uh, looked sort of like the computations for the associated derived categories, serif functor. These serif functors are sometimes fractional Flaviau. And that fraction, the computation of that fraction looked sort of like the computation that you had for this minimal exponent. I was wondering if there's some sort of relationship there. August, well, I, I can answer this question. I okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you mean the like the sum of one over AI or those numbers? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know. <laughs> maybe maybe they're related to local ankle threshold. Hey, Ludmil, can you tell us? So I mean, let's say that you consider some uh, hypersurface, fun of hypersurface in PN. Yeah. And then uh, there is a Lando Ginsburg model associated with it. Okay. So now, if you consider the D module associated with this final surface, the quantum D module, mm -hmm. 
you can get a differential equation out of it or a given tau. Okay. And then you can compute the asymptotics of this differential equation. Then the highest asymptotic, I'm sorry, I apologize. The difference between the highest and the lowest asymptotic is precisely the power of the serial functor apply to this, uh, I mean, let's say to the homology associated with the singularities of the Landau-Ginsburg model. In fact, there is a connection between asymptotics of this differential equation and the Stimbling spectrum for the Landau-Ginsburg model. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Makes perfect sense, yeah. So it's, yeah, I understand now. So it's via this other interpretation mm -hmm. of, uh, yeah. I see, okay, it, thank you. It's, uh, it would be really interesting if you, I don't know, is it possible to go backwards and, you know, get some information about uh, these exponents from the, from doing some kind of drive category? Yeah, yeah, so the, once again, I mean, so the, the this D module, the quantum D module, which of course is something related to DB sync, indeed gives you a way of computing the stimuli spectrum for certain singularity. That's great. Mm -hmm. that, that's correct. Yeah, that's really cool. Other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Mikhne for the wonderful talk. And we proceed tomorrow at 9 a.m.